Now, the psalmist, when he asks the question, what is man, doesn't start with man. Our problem in seeking to understand is that too often we begin with men and we look around and we start with our human base and seek to understand life and understand meaning and what is man just looking at man. And in so doing there is a tendency on one hand to exalt man and to worship man. But the psalmist did not begin with man but he began with God. The psalm begins, O Lord, our Lord. Now if you'll notice, the first Lord there is all capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Which indicates that this is a translation of the Hebrew name for God. Now the name of God is not God. That just bespeaks a title. The master passion of a person's life and so there are many gods. But that is his name, the God that we serve, the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth. His name is Yahweh or Yehovah, and we really are not sure of the pronunciation. It's been lost. But his name means in Hebrew, I am. Or more literally, the name Yehovah means the becoming one as God expresses in his name his desired relationship with you. The becoming one. You see, God, in desiring to relate to you, desires to become whatever you may need. Now, in the Hebrew, we have what we call, theologically, the compound names of Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Tzid Canoe, and these many compound names of Jehovah by which God expresses the various things that he will become to you. When Isaac was walking with his father, with his father Abraham towards the Mount of Sacrifice, Isaac said, well, Dad, here's the wood for the altar. Here's the fire, but where's our sacrifice? And Abraham answered him, Jehovah Jireh. God will become our provider, our God sees. God will become the provider. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Later on, when the children of Israel were suffering from a plague, God said, Moses, tell them that I am Jehovah Rapha, I have become your healer. To a person whose life is all diswrought and upset and disturbed, he becomes Jehovah Shalom. He becomes our peace. Whatever you might be needing, God wants to become that to you. The all-sufficiency for your life. The becoming one. The second Lord is capital L, small o-r-d, which indicates that it is a translation of the Hebrew word Adonai, which is a title. Which word expresses our relationship to him? That is, he is our master. So more literally, this would be translated, O Jehovah, our master. And you get the idea in the two names, one representing his relationship to me, the becoming one, and the other being my relationship to him as I submit to his lordship, to his mastery over my life. So the psalmist in seeking to understand man began with God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The name of the Lord. Jehovah, who 
has set thy glory above the heavens. Now, David spent many nights sleeping out in the open, under the open skies, before the days of city lights and smog. And thus, out there, looking up at the stars at night, he could see the whole vista of the heavens. It wasn't distorted or clouded or veiled by the smog blanket that we now have, nor obscured by the lights of the city. And so as he would lie down with his friends, looking up, they could see the constellations, the many stars, the planets and all. And David in another place wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God. Night unto night they utter their speech. Now the heavens aren't the glory of God. They only declare the glory of God. For actually his glory is above the heavens, even greater than the heavens. You see, that which has created is always greater than that which is created. Now the heavens show to us the creative power of God. But he has to be above his creation. So thy glory is above the heavens. How big is God? The Bible says that he measures the heavens with his span. Now the span is the distance between your little finger and the thumb. Scientists tell us that the universe is some 12 billion light years in radius. You say, how big is that? About that big. <laughs> as far as God is concerned. That's the glory who has set thy glory above the heavens. And so when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? Here I am dwelling on this little speck of dust we call the earth as we're rotating around the sun. But I'm only one of billions. What is man? Now I see man in his true perspective. Not as I relate to man, but as I relate to God, I see myself in the true perspective and I stand in awe of God. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What am I that God should even think about me, ever even take notice of me? Now, the truth is, is that God does think about you continually. That's the thing that always amazes me. That God should ever take any time out to think of me at all is just absolutely amazing. And yet the Bible says, David said, Lord, if I should number thy thoughts concerning me, they are more than the sands of the sea. God's thinking about me all the time. Now, we are so often prone to make the mistake of thinking that God is somehow removed from his creation. The the concept of uniformitarianism has created this idea that God set the universe into motion, He set everything into order, and then just withdrew Himself, allowing things to just evolve on their own impetus. Once having set the original forces in action, then removed Himself of it, and is now some way removed from His creation. But the Bible says not so. God is vitally involved with His creation and very conscious of every aspect of His creation. Now over in the Middle East, you talk about free enterprise. These people are the most free enterprising people I've ever met. You go over there and I think that Practically everybody is involved in merchandising, something or other. The minute your bus stops, little kids come running from all over, holding up beads, holding up hats. In fact, the little tiny kids, if you, if you stop to look at the fields of flowers, the little tiny kids will come running towards the bus, and as they're running, they'll grab a handful of flowers or weeds or whatever, and they get up there and they try and sell them to you. 
Or they'll grab rocks and try and sell you rocks. Everybody's a salesman and everybody is, is, is in some kind of an enterprise. It sort of destroys the concept of some people that free enterprise is the thing that made America great. It was God that made America great. If free enterprise would make a nation great, they'd be much greater than we are. They've got far more free enterprise than we do. Now, during the days of Jesus, the little kids probably had a way of trapping sparrows because the little kids in his day would be selling sparrows, probably for pets or something. Those little kids are very ingenious little kids. They're sharp, sharp, sharp. And they would sell two sparrows for a half a cent. Which shows that they really didn't have much value. You could buy four sparrows for a penny. And Jesus one day said to his disciples, Are not two sparrows sold for a half a cent? And yet, not one of those sparrows falls to the ground, but what your father isn't aware of it. Now, sparrows are pretty much a worthless little creature. There are so many sparrows around. Little kids can sell them four for a penny. And yet, your father is so interested and involved in his creation that not one of those little sparrows, which are not his children, they're his creation, but not one of them falls to the ground, but what your father, notice that, they're not his... You know, he's not their father, he's your father. But your father is even concerned in these worthless little sparrows. How much more then is he concerned with you when you're down? When you need help? Your father is watching. In fact, Jesus said, Your father knows the number of hairs on your head. Every one of us here this morning. He could, he could instantly tell you the number of hairs on your head. And, of course, you've had to subtract some that fell out in the comb this morning. <laughs> but he keeps track. So it is wrong to think of God as somehow removed from man. The truth is, is God is very concerned and vitally interested in you. His thoughts concerning you, if they should be numbered or more than the sands of the sea. I love to go down the beach and just run sand through my hands. And as they drop and make a little pile, I like to realize, hey, every one of those little grains represent a thought of God concerning me. And God said, my thoughts concerning you are good, not evil. Now, so many times we have the concept, you know, that God's thoughts are evil. Now, how can I make it tough on him this week? And how can I punish him for this, you know? And how can I, you know, and, and as a child I heard, God is watching you, you know, like some policeman or something ready to bring down the club on my head the moment I did something wrong. Someone told my little grandson, William, God is watching you. as though he was some cop on the beat ready to punish him. So William came to his daddy and said, Daddy, is God watching me? And his daddy said, Yes, he is, William. Because he loves you so much, he can't keep his eyes off of you. And that's what we need to realize. God is watching you because he loves you so much. He's thinking about you continually. What blessings He can bring into your life. What good He can do for you. How that He can develop your walk and your relationship with Him. Now when I consider the heavens, the work of His fingers, the moon, the stars which He has ordained, what is man that God should be mindful of me? It amazes me that God, the creator of this vast universe, takes thought of me at all. But more than that, the Son of Man that thou visitest him. 
God not only is mindful of you, but God wants to come and visit you. He delights when you come to visit him. He waits for you to come and visit. How he desires and longs for those moments that you spend with him as you just pour out your heart to him, as you share the innermost secrets of your life as you tell him of your love and your dependence, you know, oh, how he loves those moments that he can spend with you, that you give for him to visit with you. Paul said that Jesus might settle down and make himself at home in your heart. He wants to just settle down and be at home in your life. Oh, what is man that God should visit him? And yet in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. What is man that God should visit him? And yet God did come down and visit man in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And the purpose of his coming was that of the redemption of man. What is man? He declares, for thou hast made him. For years, some of the brainiest men have been trying to convince us that rather than us having been made by God, that in reality, we are the product of a long string of fortunate occurrences of accidental circumstances. That you are a product of blind chance. Throughout billions of years, there have been millions upon billions of chance, random passings of atoms and so forth, and that you in reality are just a chance combination of, of random forces that have brought you into existence by accident, a total accident, and you'll probably leave by accident one of these days. Now that is extremely humiliating and dehumanizing. For it makes man an illogical entity without a rational base. There's no reason, there's no purpose, there's no meaning for life. I am here just by chance, random accident. And I'll probably depart by a chance random accident having lived and that's it it's all over and it was just as well had never been how dehumanizing the Bible says he has made you now these same brilliant men say oh no man wasn't created in the image of God God was created by man in man's own image that man had to believe in something and so he invented the concept of God in order to satisfy some inner need that God is nothing more than the creation of man as man has created God in his own image, the anthropomorphical concepts of God. And they deny that man was created in God's own image. And yet, to truly understand man, I must see him in the right perspective, beginning with God. Thou hast made him. A little lower than the angels, now I see my place in the order of life. God is first, the angels are next, then comes man, then comes animals, and then comes the plants. I was made a little lower than the angels, but that's a lot better than a little higher than the ape. You may train an ape to peel a banana 
and to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. But that's an awfully long way from man. designing a circuit for the computer or performing brain surgery to tie off an aneurysm. I don't care how much you've trained that ape. I'm not going to let him operate on me. <laughs> There's a vast gulf between the animal and man. A little lower than the angels, and yet you have crowned him with glory and honor. And I look around at the observable world around me, and I realize that God has made man in the highest order of observable creation. He's crowned man with glory and honor. And we see the glory of man and the creative genius of man and the abilities of man that God has placed there and he's crowned him with glory and honor. And man has tremendous creative, inventive genius. And what has he used it for? To create a hundred megaton bombs to set atop of ICBM missiles that man can place within a hundred feet of any target upon the face of the earth and totally obliterate it. Wait a minute, something is wrong. What is man's concept of man if he's willing to obliterate a society? If he is using his genius to develop planes to drop bombs and destroy other men? There must be, there must be somewhere along the line a kink. And there is. Though man was created by God in the image of God, man has fallen from that image. And Genesis records for us the fall of man. Though created in the image of God, yet he rebelled against God. And he fell from that image of God. And as a result of that fall, we see the corruption, the pollution, and all that man has brought upon himself because of his greed, unbridled greed more interested in a prophet than we are pure air and pure water. More interested in destroying than saving life. Last year, the nations of the world spent one trillion dollars on military weapons while 15 million people starved to death. Where are the values? Oh, Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because when his kingdom comes, we read, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They'll take their military budgets and use them for agricultural development. Oh God, thy kingdom come. Save man from his own stupidity and from his own folly. Man was created in the image of God, but man sinned against God. And by the entrance of sin came death. Man lost his sense of value of life. He lost his meaning of life because he sought to exclude God out of his life. And he sought to see himself only in light of himself without the light of God. And man developed a perverted view of himself. And thus he thinks nothing of eradicating other men. But God, who is rich in his mercy, still loved man and decided to visit man. And God sent his only begotten Son who came 
And in spite of the fact that the Greek philosophers said that redemption was impossible, once a person had gone down, there was no lifting him up, there was no bringing him out, yet Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came to restore us into the image of God which had been lost by man's folly and sin. And the purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ to visit you today is to restore you back into the image of God. And so the New Testament speaks about the work of the Spirit in us as he conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. And we, with open face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are changed from glory to glory into that same image by his Spirit working in us. And that which was lost because of man's sin has been regained through the fact that God was willing to visit and redeem man from his sin, those who are willing to receive. God desires to visit your life today, to take the mess and the muddle that you have made of your life and to begin to bring purpose and meaning to you once more. 